All right, welcome back to the Ireland Contracting Nightly Sports Comer 12, joined by with Chris Muller here tonight. We're taking your phone calls. We're going to go right out the phone lines, Chris. We've got a ton of them. Let's go out to Eric in the North Hills. How you doing, Eric? Hey, guys. How you doing? Um, I understand what you're saying about the offensive line. I think they'll be okay. you got to remember, this is just the second game of the season, and they need time to gel. But I more or less have a problem with Matt Canada's play calling so far. And where are – is Kalen Balage and Anthony McFarlane in the running game? Because I think if you mix it up instead of having Najee run every play, that, well, McFarlane's you know, on McFarlane IR. Opens up for us. Yeah, okay. I mean, McFarlane can't come back until the fourth game of the season, and Balage uh, and Benny Snell have basically not seen the field. Richie, I know they they haven't uh, you know run the ball enough that this would necessarily be a wear and tear situation. But here's a little stat for you to show how low they think or how little they think of Balage and Snell. Najee Harris has been on the field for 97.4% of their offensive snaps. I believe all but one, two at most, but it's, that's, it, that's it. The next highest percentage of snaps played by a running back this year, Christian McCaffrey, 89%. There's not another running back at 81%. So basically, Najee Harris is on the field at all times, and that tells me more than anything, yes, they value him and what he can bring to the table, but they think that the other two guys behind him really bring nothing. Yeah, he's so much better than anything else that they have right now. Uh, but what worries me about that, I mean, this guy's a rookie. He's used to playing, what, 12, 13 games. Um, now we're looking at 17 plus the preseason, 20-some games. I mean, the guy might be worn out halfway through the season, especially when you get to the end there, and those final six games are going to be uh, <laughs> disastrous, potentially, for the Steelers. Uh, let's go back out to the phone lines. we got Jamie on the Hill District. How you doing, Jamie? I'm doing wonderful. Uh, one uh, comment I want to make about Ben Roethlisberger's demeanor. When he's on fire, two or three touchdowns, he's pointing to the sky, he's head button, and then he's another touch, just snatching his uh, chin strap off, dragging his foot to the sideline, and, 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 and that's not a good look for a leader of the team. You know, I mean, I, I did ask Ben this question a few weeks ago. Does he feel more like a teacher than, than an actual uh, you know, veteran out there? Um, and, and, you know, he, he skirted around a little bit, but answered it and almost basically said, yes, he does feel like he's teaching, but he's, he's also learning too. Um, so he, he didn't really answer it, but it, I kind of sensed that you can just see it at practice, that he's teaching everyone. Um, I don't know if he wanted that role, but that's the role he's in right now. Well, I, I would agree that his demeanor is not great. He reminds me a little bit of Aaron Rodgers in terms of how he handles press conferences after losses. I think Ben is known to traffic in passive aggressiveness to try to get his point across. I thought he was a little passive aggressive when it came to Matt Canada and the offense, talking about how they don't have a no huddle, they just have a two-minute package. That seemed a little odd. Uh, the way he kind of answered questions about Mike Tomlin's decision to punt on fourth and one, which was the wrong decision, by the way. Uh, but if you're going to be a little bit icy or a little passive aggressive when things aren't going well, then you'd better be an MVP caliber player and I think what we can all agree upon right now is that at 39 years old, Ben Roethlisberger is not that. So I don't think it's a particularly great look for him. I'm sure he's extremely frustrated, and he has cause to be. That offensive line is giving him no time to do what Matt Canada ideally would like to do. But that doesn't mean that he's handling it necessarily all that well. But he is the most important player on this team right now. He's the guy that's either going to get him to the playoffs or not. Well, if he's the bellwether, if he's the bellwether, do you want him reacting like that in pressers? Do you want to see that, or do you want to see him kind of take a, you know, keep a straight face, keep it all in-house approach? Man, I don't like the in-house approach. You know, I'm a reporter. I want these guys to say what they're thinking. Maybe passive aggressive isn't the best way to go, but I want them to come out and say, "Hey, I wanted to go for it." Now they don't. I mean, I love what John Harbaugh did uh, last night, asking, you know, calling in Lamar, "Do you want to go for it?" I, I would like to see that. <laughs> Maybe leave it up to Ben. Because he's going to go for it. Well, well, here's the thing I'll say about that. Uh, I have a couple thoughts because I thought that was just very illuminating, the way Harbaugh handled that and the way the Steelers handled theirs and how Ben said he doesn't have the agency to, to tell them, no, I want to go for it. One, he does if he really wants to. He's done it before. But two, Harbaugh handled that masterfully. The Ravens do all those decisions essentially strictly based on the math. Harbaugh already knew he was going to go for it. And, but what he did that was beautiful – is that he lets his fairly young quarterback still, a guy that's still trying to fully solidify himself kind of as a passer and as a leader, right? Even though he's an MVP winner, Richie. 
He lets Lamar, he goes, hey, do you want to do this? He knows, John Harbaugh does, that he's going to go for it, and he knows Lamar is going to say yes. But putting it on Lamar's plate like that lets him sort of have that agency, like, hey, I'm the man, coach is coming to me. You feel so invested in that. That was awesome. If I'm a Ravens fan, I love that that dynamic exists with my head coach and my quarterback, and it's that sort of a collaborative effort. And the decision itself to punt here on fourth and one yesterday, I need to say this. Mike Tomlin talks very tough all the time. You're in these press conferences, Richie, you know. He doesn't suffer fools with the media, right? When you guys ask questions he doesn't like, he spikes them like he's a volleyball player. Real tough talk. There's a lot of coaching cowardice on display when he ignores the math and doesn't go for it in these situations, especially when they happen later in games. I I just can't abide by that at all. Don't live in your fears, you know? Um, he does. He does, though. But he absolutely does. He talks real tough, and then he, he shrivels up when the moment comes uh, up for him to make a big decision like that. Yeah, I think they should have went for it. I know there was just under nine minutes, but they should have went for it right there, fourth and one. Uh, you got to try to win the game. Uh, time's not on your side. Let's go out to Mark and Carrick. How you doing, Mark? Hi. There's 20 seconds left in the game. There's no chance for the Steelers to, to win. Why didn't they just kneel on the ball? instead of our receiver getting hurt at the end there. I, I guess there's I always no a answer. chance, right? I mean, it, this, the, the, no, there's not. The, a minimal, I mean, say they could score in nine seconds and they get the onside they, you, kick you and they ride go. it back. I, 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 crazier you things have happened. I know the odds aren't for it, but it could have happened somehow. <laughs> no, it really, I don't think it actually could have. Well, if there were 20 seconds left, right, or 26 seconds, a hook and lateral play like that, best case scenario is taking what? 22 of them probably because of all the nonsense you have to go through. So you're getting the ball back with four seconds left. The onside kick's absolutely taken three or four seconds. Then there's no time left on the clock. It was almost mathematically impossible. I, I understand the frustration, although it seems like Deontay Johnson's injury is going to be a pretty minor one, fortunately. All right, now to our Tri-State Office Furniture tweet of the night. No one's happy about this Steelers victory, that's for sure. And what about Dan Orlovsky? He points out a couple key things here. Two things for me about Steelers offense, and this is a former NFL player, a pretty good collegiate player. Uh, Big Ben really hurt them early on not being patient with decisions, missed four easy checkdowns that go for big yards if thrown. And two, there has to be more to it than drop back and throw a jump ball to Claypool. I mean, he's got some good points here, Chris. The second one, I think, is the really good one. I can understand Ben being a little jittery behind that line, but where is the passing game, especially down the middle of the field between 10 and 20 yards? Where are those throws? They don't even exist. It's either these little behind the line of scrimmage passes where they're extensions of the running game, or he does chuck it up the sideline. If you're not going to use the middle of the field between the numbers, you are going to be a really easy football team to defend through the air. All right, we got to go to break. Back with more of your phone calls, maybe some tweets coming up next. Stay right there.